Wait, 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 I got one from your left wing, like, uncle, he's just like, oh, yeah, if we don't fucking start maturing the climb, then we're going to be doing everything underwater, you know what I'm saying, mate? <laughs> <laughs> climate change is a real thing, mate, you look it up, you look it up, an inconvenient okay. truth, Al Gore. <laughs> Alright, welcome back to another week of Global Wine News. We are uh, looking at three different little tidbit size uh, bits of information that have happened in the prior couple of weeks or been reported on the prior couple of weeks. We think they're kind of interesting and hopefully you will too. Uh, we have Henry and Noah uh, commenting on this as well and I'm sure the banter is going to be fun for this one. Starting us off, we have New Zealand wine grower reporting automated estimate AI to predict yields. So companies are using artificial intelligence to count something called inflorescences. Uh, basically, uh, what this means is if you can count the little flowers, which is what are called inflorescences, then you are able to make an accurate prediction of the yield that you're going to have in that year. And I'm not sure if you guys are aware, you might be aware in prior years when we deal with growers and we say, hey man, we want to be able to get six tonne of this or ten tonne of this. And what ends up happening is five tonne rocks up or yeah. like 20 tonne rocks up. It's actually really, really, really hard to predict the yield of a vineyard. Now, right. where, where I'm going with this is, how comfortable are we with machines entering the world of viticulture where there is so much romance? Where you got to you know, vibe it. This, sound, <laughs> this, sounds like, it. this sounds like <laughs> Sam Neill making a movie. It is a little <laughs> I love it. Um, no, I love the dish. Oh, look, <sighs> it's, it's really, it's such a um, polarizing comment. It's like, a lot of people don't want any machines in the vineyard, and a lot of people love like uh, producers nowadays in 2021 that only use like horse pulled carts and hose and all that kind of stuff um, in the vineyard. Uh, it does well for like a medium-sized sustainable businesses. Um, how do you but, I don't know. how do you handle the difference between so all right so I'm a wine producer. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves me because I do things authentically. I've got a horse-drawn car. I never use yeah. tractors. I never use yeah. petrol. So I can make a hundred barrels a year. I don't know. I can yeah, make yeah. that much. And then everyone's like, fuck that. Doyle makes the most incredible wine. Sorry, I put myself Doyle. Doyle makes the most incredible wine that you've ever come across. So all of a sudden, my hundred barrels a year, I need to make more of it. But if I need to make more of my wine, I can't do it with my fucking donkey drawn car, mm, so I've got mm, to use a tractor. Mm. And now all of a sudden I'm using a tractor and my wine's less valuable. So is there a certain point where like your big wine brands right now that everyone respects and everyone's got a big vibe for, they're putting so much money into it that they're out here using like the cutting, cutting edge of technology and you've got your small growers that no one's going to use using that authentic technology that makes it more valuable. Well, there's, is, there's, there a, is there a disconnect between those well, two there, things? There is, there is, and there's a number of disconnects, I think, in this industry, which is the reason why we're actually talking and highlighting a lot of these things in commentary. Um, one of those ones, when I was at university, uh, there was a, a subject that we could take called precision viticulture. And I thought this was actually really one of the most eye-opening things where they're talking about how um, uh, vineyards that are irrigated, uh, about 80%, they reckon, of all forms of irrigation are completely useless. Completely useless. Yeah, 80% yeah. of water used for irrigation is completely yeah. useless. Yeah, a, a, lot yeah. Of, right. a lot of people are so anti it. Yeah. Understandably. Understandably as well. And our sort of uh, approach with Unico is a yeah. little bit, you know, radical, where it's yeah. like, we don't want to see any irrigation because if the thing can't grow there, it can't grow there. But let's just say you are using irrigation, then you could utilize um, uh, drones to be able to fly up and above the vineyards and take photographs down of uh, the leaves because leaves when they wilt, I'm not sure if you've ever noticed, they kind of turn a darker color. Yeah, and so you could take lots of little snapshots all the time, you know, all throughout the day, send them up, take a shot, yeah. send it down, up, and you can actually use yeah. AI to be able to go, that vine there is experiencing water stress, that yeah. vine there needs irrigation. So what we yeah. do typically is just, oh, we just irrigate because it's gonna be hot soon. That's yeah. how we do it. That's actually a, a lot of growers just that's, literally that's do that. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. So wow, what they're doing yeah. is then they're putting sort of individual, what they call solenoids, which um, can block off uh, the flow to the yeah. irrigation. So you can go out there with a flower pot and just like, you know, watering. Yeah, if you, want to, if you, want, like, you need a little drip. If you so, wanted to. Yeah. So in this instance, they're using technology, which really is not a very romantic uh, prospect, but being able to achieve sustainability, which is one of those marketing terms, yeah, but, isn't it? It's like, you know, the most like sustainable brands that, we want to get behind. Saying that technology is not like uh, traditional or something like that, 
you can use you can now use technology to make traditionally bespoke products so if you talk about a wine that mm. you're using technology to make sure that it is the most authentic representation of the wine from that region as we were talking about oh, as we've been talking about this entire time with different mm. regions representing different things if you can guarantee this is the expect, best expression of the grape that you're trying to grow why should technology cheapen that experience? If you're able to represent the great, the, the, the land that you're from mm. as best as possible, because right now, humans are fucked. Like, we, we are influencing how the planet works. You know what I mean? Sorry, not, we're not Say getting Henry political. Spiral. We're there not needs to be a button. It's we're like not, he's spiraling. We're not, we're not getting political. We're not getting political. <laughs> we're in the hole. But if you talk about, like, traditionally, this is how much uh, rain this region gets, right? Mm. This is how much water it yeah. gets. Yeah. And then you talk about, in the last 50 years, for whatever reason, yeah, it's now getting less rainfall. If you yeah. can use technology to more accurately res represent how much water it was getting 50 years ago, can you not make a better example of that region's wine than you could have without technology? So that is, in essence, an old school wine mm. made with new. This, this is, is that a not conversation a is that, that could that not go what on technology for literal hours. Yeah, for hours. Because we could, yeah, we got a bit, but we got some chunkier stuff. But one, one thing I actually find really interesting is we talk about horse-drawn carts and we talk about plows and stuff like that, like that's not technology. Yeah, And I do exactly. wonder if you go Victor, all the way back then and are like, oh man, he's using technology in his vineyard. Yeah. Uh, what's, yeah. what's the step yeah. backwards and the, and from horse-drawn carts and the, plows? The, the guy using... across the road's digging with his own hands. <laughs> yeah. You're using your family nice and children to plow the land. Old, old, old mate caveman over here, you know, he's producing Neanderthal crew wine. Uh, you know, how does how does it actually work working backwards? I think the world of wine is very dynamic. Uh, yeah. and, I love technology though, I just think it needs to be used appropriately. Yeah. Moving on to uh, talking about uh, wine of authenticity and wine of a genuine pro. So, Wonderful. the West Australian reported that Kylie Minogue uh, makes a secret trip to Margaret River. Uh, the winery that she's collaborating with is Howard Park, it's part of her own wine brand. Cool. Not the first that we've heard of Australian celebrity wine brands either. Um, we've seen. I literally said Sam Neill before. Even though it's Sam Neill? No, I said Sam Neill just before. Daniel Ricciardo. DR3, which DR3. is very funny. Very close to DRC. I do yeah. wonder whether or not uh, Dylan, Domain Della Romani Conti has an issue with that, but Henry. I'd like to point out the idea that Kylie Minogue can make a sick trip anywhere without me knowing. <laughs> when it pop, everyone knows where she is at any given time, so this is ridiculous. I'm not engaging with it. Um, what do we, how do we feel about this? Because I know Kylie Minogue already makes a Prosecco. It's like Prosecco yeah. by Kylie. Um, as we sure all that, know. Is that such, that's knows? such a Kylie drink. That's that's Kylie. such a as, Kylie as, drink. As, as y'all should know, uh, she already does make, uh, the, the brand is quite established already. Um, how do we feel about uh, celebrity wine? Authentic, not authentic, yummy, not yummy, has its place, doesn't have its place? Uh, has its place, it's gotta be yummy. If not, get out of town. So if it's yummy, it passes the pub test. Yeah, I'm, 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 if, yeah, I'm okay with it. I what if you have to pay double? I think it exists in a. <laughs> I think it exists in a completely different realm of like, if I buy um, Andy by Hamish, which is Hamish's Hamish and, Hamish yeah, and Andy's yeah, yeah. fragrance, it's not because I want to smell like it. It's because I want to own the bottle. So if I'm buying DR3, which is what I assume Daniel Ricardo's wine is called. Nice. Yes, it is. <laughs> cool, great. <laughs> That's how funny, I didn't know that before. <laughs> Daniel Ricardo. If I'm buying... number, I think number three is his like, his, his, like number. Yeah. That's, yeah. I knew it was three, but that so funny. You know there's some like smart marketer behind yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, like, yeah, DR3, that'll love it. Anyway, so if I was buying DR3, it's not because I'm like, I wonder it's... what example of the grape Daniel can give me here. It's because I want a bottle of DR3 on my shelf. You know what I mean? So like, if I'm buying Kylie Minogue's Prosecco, it's not because it's better than other Proseccos I'm drinking, it's because I want that taste of Kylie. KM, Ky yeah, I want the taste of Kylie. You're exactly right. Yeah. So it's good marketing. If you have too much Kylie Prosecco, you'll be spinning around. <laughs> oh, I hate you, Noah. We are moving on to that comment. So they, I they hate you so much. <laughs> The Guardian, uh, this one's actually a really interesting one, I reckon this one's a meaty one for us. Uh, Fancy a deep red, the rise of underwater wineries. So this was, um, I was actually working in Champagne uh, when this happened. There was a, uh, a ship that was uh, raised from uh, the deep seas that actually had bottles of, of Champagne. And uh, this one here in 1998, uh, another one, uh, a Swedish trade ship was sunk by a German U-boat in World War One in the Baltic Sea. They pulled it up, had a whole bunch of 1907 hide sick champagne on it, <laughs> in which they proceeded to start cracking open and, and having a good time. Wow. And, and, and they were wow. like, 
holy shit, this tastes really good because you gotta remember it's it's maturing in very cold temperatures. Mm. The pressure is holding the cork in. It's obviously, uh, you know, one of the reasons why yeah. you put wine on their side is to keep the cork moist so it doesn't actually dry out. Uh, and it's very, very, very dark. So it's sort of the perfect. That's incredible. Yeah, it that, is incredible. Is so there are like stories of Roman wines being pulled up. There now. was um, there was a story in Australia of uh, in I think uh, the mid to late 2000s, like maybe 2010s, of there was a shipwreck off the coast of Victoria that was been underground for a, like underwater, sorry, uh, for a long period of time, and it was from like a ship in the eight, early 1800s that like crashed upon the shore uh, and they got all these wines out but they didn't just like crack them open and drink them they did a whole tasting and invited James Halliday, uh, yeah. Max Allen, all these people and they cracked open this cork and unlike clearly like this they were like oh the wines are kind of not good <laughs> <laughs> show you this this is underwaterwine.com uh, so it is, it is <laughs> Yeah. So this is the earth is flat talk. <laughs> no, 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 you will love this. So people are now uh, maturing wine yeah. in the Baltic Sea, yeah. like lifting them down and then like pulling them up. Yes. Champagne indeed is um, like uh, being heavily invested. Like I believe the uh, Louis Roderer family it, it, is the maker of Cristal. Well, the is thing is it makes Cristal sense. It does make sense. Yeah. It's dark. There's a lot of pressure on, but you're not getting anything. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense, but I just don't like it, Brendan. So I just don't there like is, it. And, and there have been various attempts in, uh, to be able to mimic this. Obviously, there's not just the, the lowering of bottles like this company is doing. Um, I, I believe they're called, they've got a particular name, Crusoe Treasure Underwater mm. Winery. Um, but I remember Lamashuk in uh, South Africa and Swatland, I believe, um, uh, actually grabbed barrels and put them underwater, actually put barrels inside fermenters and then filled it up with water yeah. and then held the barrels underneath to see if there was any changes in maturation. Apparently it it did mature incredibly well. Very different, as you would imagine, very reductive atmosphere. Mm. Are we gonna start maturing wine underwater? No. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I got one from your left wing, like uncle, he's just like, oh yeah, if we don't fucking start maturing the climate, then we're gonna be doing everything underwater. You know what I'm saying, mate? <laughs> Climate change is a real thing, mate. You look it up. You look it up. An inconvenient okay. truth. Al Gore. Okay. Um, no, anyway, wine news. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the amount of effort that goes into this is definitely not worth the reward. No. Uh, let's just continue enjoying wine like we do. Because again, this, these are cellar, these are cellar experiments that have happened over a hundred years. So the people who uh, accidentally put them underwater have not been able to do, enjoy the fruits of their labour. I just can't wait to yeah. call a fuck up in my workplace an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we're definitely going to sign off. And Henry's going to stop drinking wine. Uh, <laughs> guys, thank you so much for joining us for this week of Global Wine News. Hopefully, it's been mildly educational and wildly entertaining as always. Uh, Brendan, Noah, Henry, signing off, catch you next week.